Greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this presentation entitled Our First and Sacred Duty, Non-Involvement in Politics and Obedience to Government. This presentation will cover the following items. I will start with a short conclusion um, and ask a number of questions, including why study this principle? What function does this principle serve? How does the Baha'i community engage in politics? And then uh, round out our presentation with, uh, with a conclusion. So if there's anything that you're going to take away from this presentation, I would ask you to focus on three, these three. They're not, it's not exclusive, but if you're gonna take away something from this presentation, this is what I would ask you to focus on. That this principle acts as a safety measure for the Baha'i community, that adherence to this principle frees us from the pitfalls of partisan politics and allows us to focus on the collective building, uh, collective society building efforts aimed at the unification of the peoples of the world. And lastly, that understanding this principle allows us to articulate it and clearly explain its purposes to friends, our networks, those of us around us who may have suspicions, questions, or queries about our posture vis-a-vis -vis different issues. So just to answer these like, you know, very quickly as a backgrounder to, to why should we should study this principle, um, I'd like us to think about um, some of the things that the House of Justice identified in some of the letters that, um, that are going to be uh, examined today. Um, one of the elements that, that, um, that stands out is that uh, this principle tacitly recognizes the legitimate desire to reduce current suffering and injustice facing the peoples of the world. And here's a quote from a, a letter dated December 8, 1967 from the House of Justice to the individual. Because love for our fellow man and anguish at their plight are essential parts of true Baha'i life, we are continually drawn to do what we can to help them. However, there is a caveat. We must remain focused on our ultimate objective, which is the spiritual awakening, awakening and regeneration of mankind. So uh, this focus will prevent us from diverting our, our energies uh, into channels which are ultimately doomed to failure as the House of Justice highlights in this letter. So our primal focus and our privilege truly as Baha'is is to focus on the spiritual awakening and regeneration of mankind. Apologies. So uh, the House of Justice in these letters uh, that will again be explored in this presentation um, highlight the following that we we are to study this principle in order to understand it, to be able to articulate it, and to dispel misconceptions. Um, and so I come to this conclusion based on, again, an analysis of uh, some of the correspondence that uh, you will no doubt have seen in the um, a companion resources that was shared with you. Uh, this is specifically from a letter to the, from the NSA of uh, from the Universal House of Justice to the to National Spiritual Assemblies in Africa, and they indicate that they're writing this letter uh, to them to help clarify some issues, and that a lack of appreciation of the implications of this principle has led to blurred uh, a blurred vision by some believers believers in the past, and has resulted in errors of judgment which have retarded the progress of the faith in their countries. We study this principle to be able to articulate it as well. Uh, and this is uh, taken from a letter from the Universal House of Justice to uh, the NSA of Kayana in 1989. Uh, in this letter, the, the NSA is encouraged uh, that the friends not only understand its import, but also positively and confidently explain it to non-Baha'is. This principle also serves for understanding it and articulating it will help dispel mis misconceptions about what may be perceived as an indifference to the suffering of the world. And the House of Justice says in this letter to the Baha'is of Iran in March 2nd, 2013, that it behooves you to respond to the growing interest of your fellow citizens in understanding 
the Baha'i attitude towards politics. Lest misconceptions be allowed to weaken the bonds of friendship you are establishing with so many souls. So just by way of background, um, both myself and a group of, of friends uh, went about studying the guidance of Shoghi Effendi and 18 letters of the House of Justice between 1916 and, uh, 1967 and, and 2021 in order to better um, understand the contours of this principle and, and appreciate its application in different contexts. These letters were written to individual believers, to national communities, as well as to uh, national spiritual assemblies. And the context of each of these letters really provide significant highlights um, to the, the meaning of this principle and what it looks like in different contexts. Um, clearly, uh, those of you familiar with the March uh, 2nd, 2013 letter from the House of Justice, which uh, could be read as a treatise on this principle, uh, is more comprehensive and actually goes into the philosophical realm. Um, we wanted to really look at all these letters uh, and, and examine um, this principle in context. And uh, you, could, you could kind of say that the March 2nd, 2013 letter is a bit of a cheat sheet or a Coles notes, um, but we wanted to really suffer through these letters and, and understand them better. Uh, this was a collective uh, participant-led inquiry where we read all the letters individually, uh, and we divided the letters amongst ourselves in, a, in, in an effort to deepen our understanding of this principle on an individual, but it be able to cultivate our respective presentation skills and essentially respond to the House of Justice's uh, call that we be both understand, articulate, uh, and are be able to articulate this principle. As I go through this presentation, I would just get you to think on um, a couple of things. One, that this principle acts as a safeguard for the integrity of the faith and its objectives, uh, implying or implicating the covenant um, uh, generally. So have that in the back of your mind, uh, but also I just want to offer a couple of metaphors. Um, uh, one is that of uh, guardrails. Uh, another one is uh, that of a nest or a home. And um, this principle has been likened to, uh, well, Shoghi Effendi has called it our, our first and sacred duty, which um, uh, lends um, to the title of this presentation. Dr. Ali Davoudi, in his article, Non-Involvement in Politics, refers to this principle as the talisman's principle, talisman principle, and the talisman being an amulet that serves as an invocation or a prayer in order to protect the bear from harm. Uh, I would ask you to keep these in mind as these symbols and these images in mind as we go through, but I'm going to explore the two, for the first two here, guardrails and nest. So guardrails, if we can liken the revelation of Baha'u'llah and the, the vision of Baha'u'llah to, um, you know, a path forward, a highway in this case, guarded by rails on either side. The rails really act as a way of keeping us on that path and also protecting us from the perils of both oncoming traffic, which can be devastating and deadly for us, uh, or the, the um, ditches uh, and here, you know, quite steep hills on, on the other side of the, the guardrail. Uh, secondly, if we think about the, the function of a nest, the ne nest acts as the first home for fledglings uh, before they eventually take flight. The nest uh, protects the fledglings from the elements and gives them warmth, uh, gives them a place to um, grow in a protective space uh, before they eventually uh, build up courage, strength, and all, all that they require before they take flight. So I want to start off by asking the question, what is politics? Um, the title of this slide is Baha'i Politics. And so that may you know, jump out at you. Uh, and hopefully it'll make more sense as I go along. But uh, let's start off by describing what politics is uh, in the first instance. Um, the quote here is taken from um, take, uh, Making the Cro Crooked Straight, uh, chapter six which was written by Ulrich Golmer. 
and this chapter, this specific section was uh, is entitled "The Concept of Baha'i Politics Baha'i Scripture." Uh, Ulrich Golmer, in turn, uh, relies on Abdul Baha's description of politics as, as ultimately um, like the status quo politics being having its foundation of war, um, characterized by delimitation, defense, aggression, and a desire to assert one's own interests. This type of pol political activity, Abdul Baha says, is, um, uh, or uh, Mr. Golmer says, is uh, concerned with the retention acquisition of power in which all participants in the political arena are classified as either allies or opponents, friends or enemy. So these are really, really um, politics that are um, characterized by a dichotomous reality, a, a kind of manichism, black or white thinking, uh, us and them mentality, all or nothing, etc. cetera. So when we talk about Baha'i politics, we must very much distinguish uh, from the description of politics as I just uh, laid out in the previous slide. Ultimately, when Baha'is talk about politics, uh, specifically institutions, we're talking about the science of govern governance and the organization of human society. There is a recognition by the House of Justice in this letter uh, dated April 27, 1995, that clearly the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth is a political in enterprise in as much as it deals with the organization of human affairs. However, the House of Justice is clear that we eschew political methods towards the achievement of our aims. Baha'is and the revelation of Baha'u'llah is focused on the concentrating of revitalizing hearts, uh, minds and behavior of people and presenting a working model as evidence of the reality and the practicality of the ways of life that we propound. So politics in the Baha'i sense is about, not about partisanship. Um, uh, it is about, when we use the word politics, we're really talking about the science of government. Um, and we definitely um, are distanced from the uh, predominant methods uh, that govern uh, human, the human contest for power at present. So in order to further deepen our understanding, what, what does this, well, how do Baha'is conceive or conceptualize politics? Uh, what is power? I would uh, draw your attention to the letter of the House of Justice dated March 2nd, 2013, which I've already referred to, um, where um, the House indicates that relationships that bind the individual community and institutions of society will re require an examination of the concept of power. And the House of Justice in that letter notes that unlike the kind of power, vision or understanding of power that predominates uh, contemporary society, um, uh, power uh, for Baha'is or in the Baha'i view is, is not a finite entity, which is to be seized and jealously guarded. It constitutes a limitless capacity to transform uh, to transform that resides in the human race as an entire body. Uh, this is significant. You can see like if you were to channel or if you were to um, talk about politics generally, uh, power is seen as a finite resources that is to be um, you know, fought for and um, um, you know, the, assuring its continuance within your within your grasp is of the utmost importance. What is the Baha'i approach to politics? The House of Justice uh, in a letter to two individuals noted that Baha'u'llah has made it abundantly, abundantly clear that the first step um, essential for health and harmony of the whole world of mankind is its unification. This is a very distinct um, approach to what predominates now where uh, most people uh, in the world and most movements concentrate on remedying the multitude of ills besetting mankind uh, with the expectation that the resolution of these problems will lead, ultimately lead to unity. Uh, the Baha'i community is focused on a broader vision of uni the unification of the whole of mankind based on the fundamental understanding of the oneness of humanity. So we're not really looking to, to remedy um, um, 
ills or 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 various you know oppressions here and there we're we're going for the total package um the baha'i uh, the house of justice uh, warns us against uh, in this effort my apologies of ex two extremes one of entering political struggles the maelstrom of political struggles and on one hand, on the other, to withdraw utterly from any interest in the affairs of men outside of the Baha'i community. We are really looking for a middle way that requires wisdom and mature judgment. Um, so specifically, Baha'is are not interested in, in, in uh, occupying positions in contemporary institutions of power. Uh, in this paragraph, the House of Justice says, you know, we're not trying to get into political office or get a political majority or start a political party. Um, uh, again, I, as I noted just momentarily ago, uh, the guidance of the Baha'i institutions offered to mankind does not comprise in a series of specific answers to current problems, rather the illumination of an entirely new way of life. We clarify objectives. Um, we promote the principles of the Baha'i faith, um, which are indispensable to the maintenance of peace. In this way, Baha'is are constantly engaged in laying the groundwork for a permanent peace, the most great peace. This is our objective, ultimately. This is the purpose of a Baha'i politics, uh, so to speak. Um, how do Baha'is respond to their own oppression? And we take uh, insight into this based on what's happening in, in, to the friends in Iran. We deal with those who oppress us with loving kindness, with patience and forbearance, and counter insults with words of peace and affection. It's a very different form of politics. Uh, one that really, uh, where, where the Baha'i community itself does not respond to grievances, but um, it's a radical form of love. Baha'is employ a discursive approach in their politics. We look at building constructive public discourse. We go beyond divisions and fissures. We approach issues with humility and discernment, as well as respect for prevailing laws. Uh, another very important hallmark of Baha'i politics is that we neither, um, uh, in our public remarks, we neither show support or criticism of public figures. Uh, this is a very subtle and very difficult thing. At times, sometimes we see political figures um, acting in a way that appear to be in harmony with the Baha'i faith. It seems like we might say, well, you know, what's the harm in this? Um, but in this guidance and, and elsewhere, um, it is noted that, uh, you know, um, the institutions that predominate um, govern society as well as any individual uh, political figure, um, however, um, benevolent, however kind, however insightful, however in tune with the zeitgeist, um, the revelation of Baha'u'llah uh, is the, the, the remedy that will um, heal the world of its of the ills of uh, division and um, that are the hallmark of, of society at the moment. Okay, turning to institutions, by looking at these, at these writings, uh, at these letters rather, uh, we, we note that um, institutions take actions which rise above partisan political manifestations and controversies. Institutions also engage in consultation with other institutions. And in this case, the NSA of the Mariana Islands is encouraged, um, this with respect to indigenous rights, to uh, draft a statement, um, but before releasing it, uh, check with the World Center. So. Again, institutions are in a position to, to, to enter uh, a public discourse. However, they are still required uh, or being asked to engage with the World Center. What is clear from these letters and from the guidance is that the decision when to engage in politics cannot be left up to the individual. Um, and here it's noted that it is important that decisions as to conduct of such relations be made by authorized institutions and not by individuals. 
that individual judgment is not sufficient. And this is said elsewhere, uh, especially in the guidance of Shoghi Effendi, that the, these problems are far too complex for the individual judgment. Uh, again, um, questions about whether Baha'is serve on boards or committees or non-political offices should be answered by national spiritual assemblies. Uh, the roles of the, the national spiritual assemblies emphasized continuously in these, in these uh, letters. It is essential that such endeavors be carried under the aegis of the national spiritual assembly. Consultation plays a fundamental role in determining um, how to engage, how individuals engage in politics. Individual Baha'is often consult with institutions in determining how they can best serve as individuals and how they can respond to this natural desire um, as the changes and chances of the world uh, you know, evolve um, and, and uh, meet their responsibility to bring to bear the revelation of Baha'u'llah on these various um, important issues that arise from time to time. In conclusion, to wrap up some of the elements that we've looked at, the purpose of the Baha'i faith is the unification of the peoples of the world in one universal cause and one common faith. This process proceeds through ebbs and flows, successes and setbacks, crisis and victory. And this is set out in, uh, by Shoghi Effendi in his foreword to his uh, magnum opus, God Passes By. I'll leave that quote with you. Understanding that, understanding this dynamic of crisis and victory uh, helps us appreciate this principle further. As uh, cri these crises ensue, as these victories unfold, as setbacks um, come about with respect to the unification of humanity, this principle preserves the integrity of the faith, keeps us on the right path in the short term and despite painful setbacks, and protects our fellow believers in other lands. I'll elaborate these on these uh, individually in the following slides. This principle protects us from self-destruction. As these setbacks continue and as these hardship, hardships and, and barriers to the, one, to the emancipation of humanity and to the oneness of humanity, there may be knee-jerk reactions or desires to find short-term solutions to very profound problems that may set us up to get involved in politics. However, Shoghi Effendi warns that if we become involved in these issues, um, that we will be lost because of the nature of the forces that operate in the political sphere and because the methods, contention, animosity, a very di dichotomous um, way of viewing things, uh, we will get sucked into them. Shoghi Effendi actually offers a more dire analysis indicating that should we give ourselves over to these faulty systems that we will destroy ourselves. Adherence to the principle preserves the integrity of the faith. It protects us as individuals and institutions from becoming tools in the furtherance of political interests that are contrary to the objectives of the faith. This preservation of integrity in turn bolsters the claim that Baha'is are indeed loyal to and well-wishers of the government, a position that Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha Shoghi Effendi, and the Universal House of Justice have all painstakingly emphasized in their numerous correspondence with state officials and with the Baha'i world. Adherence to this principle also protects fellow believers in other lands. As the House of Justice has noted in the letters, its letters of December 8th, 1967, and March 2nd, 2013, an unwise act or statement by Baha'is in one country could result in grave setbacks for the faith there or elsewhere to maintain its cohesion and integrity as a global entity and to ensure that Baha'is in one country do not jeopardize the existence of those elsewhere. Lastly, there are covenantal implications in the study of the subject. Following these principles connects us to the covenant. 
We follow because we recognize the we follow these principles because we recognize the authority of the manifestation of God. We also recognize the authorities of the successors to the manifestation of God, the center of the covenant, the guardian, and the universal house of justice. By following this guidance, institutions, individuals, and communities free themselves to focus their energies on their respective spheres of activity. This creates order and efficiency for our community. This obedience in turn connects us further to the covenant. As individuals, we consult with institutions, institutions advise and or decide, and we obey out of love. Our obedience in turn serves to foster trust between individuals and institutions. And as always, there are the right to appeal remains and any criticisms or complaints of institutional decisions remain a responsibility as outlined by Shoghi Effendi uh, in his guidance. Uh, set out in other correspondence. Uh, and as lastly, and as a matter of order, we cannot attempt to approximate the significance of this uh, and implication of these principles outside of a covenantal an analysis, uh, a covenantal and analytical framework and practice. We first turn to the writings of the central figures and learn of their actions in this realm. And we seek out the guidance of the heads of the faith in order to understand this principle. And we follow based on their authority set out in the writings and guidance. So it's a bit of a, of a, of a cyclical nature, but our first, the reason we, and, and to bring us back to the, the group that, that I worked with to study these principles, we, we approach the writings of both the House of Justice and the Guardianship, who in turn quote, quote, Baal and Abdul Baha. And we do so on the premise that they have the authority and their authority is set out in Baha'u'llah's Katabiyad, Katabi Akhtas, uh, the Will and Testament of Abdul Baha uh, and uh, Shoghi Effendi's writings. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this presentation and I look forward to your questions and comments.